Journal log of HM ship time. Date, Monday, 9th January, 1815. Weather, AM, cloudy. Weather, PM, not available. Orders and letters received, none. Letters and orders written, letter to Captain B.T. Patterson, commanding the United States Naval Forces, New Orleans, stating his re uh, readiness to comply with his propositions respecting the exchange of prisoners. Ditto to ditto, stating that every facility shall be given to exchange with prisoners. Water to senior officers off Chandler Island to make return of American prisoners of the fleet without delay. Letter to Captain Swain of Statira, directing his bringing Major General Power and 27th Regiment to join immediately. Also, should there be any flatboats there, to bring two with him. Due to that, should the Statira have sailed, to send any frigate or sloop with the enclosed dispensions. Due to Rear Admiral Coburn, that should the 27th Regiment be embarked in transports, to re-embark them in troop ships and send them singly to join them. A little bit of history. A little bit of uh, uh, dullness about the whole business. Now, the, uh, this uniform, by the way, is, a, is an historical recreation of General, I should say, uh, Admiral Cochrane. It's made by an historic tailor uh, Timothy Pickles, many of whom I think uh, may have heard last, attended uh, last year's lectures. And um, it is really good on a very cold day. <laughs> um, the, many people know um, Cochrane, but only a bit about him. He's a knight of the bar. Vice Admiral of the Red Squadron of His Majesty's Fleet and Commander in Chief of His Majesty's Ships and Vessels, employed and to be employed in the River St. Lawrence along the coast of Nova Scotia, the Isles of Pentecostia and Madeleine, St. John and Cape Britain, the Bay of Fundy, and at and about Bermuda and Summers Islands, the Hammer Islands of the Gulf of Mexico, to the Tropic of Cancer. Etc. 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 And on the Jamaican mission, I should say the Jamaican station. That's just a little technical stuff about uh, the man I am uh, impersonating. His um, he was born in 1758, died in 1832. He was the younger son of the eighth Earl of Dundonald. Thomas Cochran. His older brother Archibald became the ninth Earl upon the death of their father. Archibald's son, also named Thomas, became the tenth Earl of Dundonald. Joined the Navy and saw the world, immortalizing his own career in the 1860-1861 bestseller, two volumes, The Autobiography of a Seaman by Lord Cochran. It's well here to note that there was hardly a male Cochrane who did not serve, serve some time in the Navy and the Army. In the Battle of the Nile, this is all based on the fact that, that he's a dominant figure, but few people, few people know about Cochrane. So I'm going back a bit to August 1798. In the Battle of the Nile, Cochrane was appointed, appointed beach master. Um, uh, uh, first for the British Navy, a maneuver first in the British Navy, during a successful and amphibious invasion on Egyptian soil. He served a year in Parliament. In 1804, he was advanced to Rear Admiral, and in 1809, to Vice Admiral. At the beginning of 1814, he was appointed head of the North American Station and hastened to his new assignment on the crew. At the age of 56, he was acknowledged to be rather portly and very much a gentleman, rather like myself. <laughs> he was known as a competent professional. Subordinates found him easy to get along with. Again, 
His ship, HMS Atomic, was a French vessel with a notable history. With the mighty Orient, it held the center of French ships of the line at the fabled Battle of the Nile. Both were mercilessly shelled by the British. The Orient finally disintegrated in a massive explosion and sank. The Tonnant's commander, Admiral Aristide Aubert du Petit Trois, having lost both arms and one leg to an incoming ordinance, asked to be propped up on a brand barrel, from whence he cried out to his crew as he bled to death, never surrender, never surrender. That is about a famous uh, incident in naval history. Eventually, the crew had to surrender. The British boarded the burning hull, does the flame, and towed it back to their own port, where it was refitted and put into British service without rechristening. When Cochrane left promptly from North America, he left behind his, uh, his nephew, Thomas Cochrane, whom he appointed as a flag captain in the American theater. His first task was to refit one more time HMS Tonnet, then resting in Chatham, an 80 gunner for upcoming engagements with American and French navies. So much for Cochrane's background. His credentials in the second half of the war may be derived from the following letters. In a missive dated 20 January 1814, John Wilson Croker, Secretary for the Admiralty, wrote to Cochrane about a new assignment. And I will begin a quote. My Lord's Commissioner of the Admiralty, having been pleased to appoint you to relieve Admiral Sir J. B. Warren in the command of the Halifax Station, you will, of course, from the Admiral, receive from the Admiral all standing uh, and unexecuted orders. In a missive dated January 20th, 1814, and received on 8th August, Croker wrote to Cochrane conveying the expediency of undertaking an expedition against the enemy's settlements in the Gulf of Mexico. Close quote. Apparently, Lieutenant General Sir Roland Hill had been promised to lead a large force, but a smaller force under Major General Ross would have to do. Open quotation. As your letter holds out an expectation that a severe blow may be struck against the enemy by a force so large as it, as it was at first supposed, it has been determined to enable you to carry out the operations proposed to you uh, into effect. And isn't that always the way? When you come to war, you end up getting less, especially in the military. And this is dated 20th June 1814, and received on 8th June, uh, August, Cochran wrote to Croker to express the naval's everlasting lament. The force being so much inferior to what I expected, I cannot, of course, carry my original intentions into execution. I must, therefore, be regulated in my future movements by the circumstances of the moment. In a missive dated 6th September 1814, marked most secret, Henry Earl Bathurst, Secretary for War of the Colonies, advised Major General Ross, Robert Ross, commanding His Majesty's troops on the coast of the United States, of the military means now at his disposal, and explained the goals of the Southern Expedition, which is, of course, our Norman Expedition. The first of these objects is to obtain command of the embouchure of the Mississippi, to deprive the settlements of America of their communication with the sea. The second is to occupy some important and valuable possession, by the restoration of which we may improve the conditions of peace, which may entitle us to exact its return at the price of peace. So Alexander Cochran and yourself will best be able to judge with the success of the expedition and the ultimate attainment of one or both of these objects are more likely to be secured by their proceeding directly against New Orleans, or by moving in the first instance into the back, pipes of, back parts and no doubt pipes of Georgia, 
and the country of the friendly Indians. And it has led to your joint discretion to decide upon this question. In a missive dated 3rd August, I should say 3rd October 1814, writing from the Tonnet, which had a crew of 700, off, Hall off Halifax, Carbon wrote to Croker, who no doubt cast him right onto the Bathurst. I have every prospect of the fullest success attending the expedition. And unless the United States sent any great reinforcements to New Orleans, I consider the force to be employed as perfectly adequate without the assistance of the Marines. And I met one here today, and he was not too happy about that. <laughs> whom I wish to employ on the service of equal consequence. First. So much for Cochrane's credentials as a commander in chief. There follow several instances of work of the weaponry he used. First of these was retaliation. The war between Great Britain and the United States was conducted in a variety of modes. Least known and appreciated is diplomatic correspondence. Two letters cited here make it sound like a war of words written by cunning satirists like Jonathan Swift and, and Samuel Butler. Butler, who I feel uh, sure um, would, would, would have enjoyed the Paris satirists of our own day. If Monroe were unwilling to do so, Conquering would be forced to relate retire by ravaging such towns and districts upon the American coast as may be found a sale of close coast. Conquering was referring to the destruction committed months before when American forces destroyed York the upper, the capital of Upper Canada, capturing the Duke of Gloucester, 16, a 16 gunner, burning a vessel near completion of the stocks, 30 guns, looting empty houses, and putting the torch to the Parliament buildings, government house, and some military installations. He concluded his letter with these steely words. I had hoped this contest would have terminated without my being obliged to resort to severities, which are contrary to the usage of civilized warfare. And as it has been with extreme reluctance and concern that I have found myself compelled to adopt this system of devastation. Although the letter was dated 18 August, it may have been posted on that day or any time in the next several days. The distance between the Patuxent River and the State Department was comparatively modest as the crow flew, but Cochrane's letter had a circuitous route traveling from the British ship, uh, from a British ship to an American ship, thence to land, and then by horse to the State Department. In the meantime, on 24th August, Rear Admiral George Coburn, with an invasionary force backing him up, and a torch in hand, entered the president's house, laid in the White House. He did not have an invitation. <laughs> no one answered the door. The table was set with cupboards laid for 40 guests, according to diarist Robert Glyde, of a tenant 85th, 85th, uh, 85th Light Infantry Regiment. I am quoting him. Several kinds of wine in cut glass containers were cooling on the sideboard. Plate holders stood by the fireplace, filled with dishes and plates. Knives, forks, and spoons were arranged for immediate use. Everything, in short, was ready for the entertainment of a ceremonious party. Such were the arrangements in the dining room whilst in the kitchen were other, others answerable to them in every respect, spits loaded with joints of various sorts, turning before the fire, the fire. pots, so saucepans, and other culinary utensils stood upon the grate, and all the other requisites for an elegant and substantial repast were in the exact state which indicated that they had been lately and precipitated. Fly did not mention dessert, but according to Henry Sargent's dinner party, a painting by Henry Sargent in 1814, 
in which 18 gentlemen were seating at a rectangular table. For dessert, there would be platters of fruit, namely grapes, pears, peaches, pineapple, as well as rich cake, fruit biscuits, and fruit preserves, all accompanied by uh, fruit wine. Gobert so allowed the men to partake of the food and drink, but to take no more than one souvenir each from the house. His was to take the seat cushion from Dolly Madison's rocker. He said then, and maintained, maintained for years later, that it was still warm, <laughs> and the set was still strong. The house went up in flames, as did other government buildings. The perfect retaliation against American damage to Canada. On 6 September 1814, James Monroe, his office building having been destroyed by Coburn, but able to write from an undisclosed location, not too far from Dick Cheney's eyes, <laughs> uh, uh, he managed to fire off of the reply to Coburn. It seemed with the greatest surprise that this system of devastation, which has been practiced by the British forces, so manifestly contrary to the usage of civilized warfare, is placed by you on the ground of retaliation. No sooner were the United States compelled to resort to war against Great Britain than they resolved to wage it in a manner most consonant to the principles of humanity and to those friendly relations which it was desirable to preserve between the two nations after the restoration of peace. So much for Cochran's use of retaliation as a weapon against the, against the Americans. His second weapon was weather. Sometime in April 1814, Cochran wooed the Creek Indians and other Indian nations with honey-tongued British officers and handsome flyers done up by the clerks on the tongue. Here, O oh, ye brave chiefs and warriors and other Indian nations, the great King George, our beloved father, has long wished to assuage the sorrows of his warlike Indian children and to assist them in the regaining, in regaining their rights and possessions from their base and perfidious oppressors. Mine, those Indians had fine literary style. <laughs> uh, the same principle. That is enough about that. Uh, they wheedled the, the Creeks and um, and and uh, and uh, Admiral Admiral Cochran uh, was in and out of the battles. And uh, about them, you heard from the University speaker. And, um, and you may find more about that in, oh, I would say a couple, uh, two dozen fine books over the last 20 years. Um, <coughs> and with that, I wish you uh, the following seat, fair, 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 uh, fair, and following seats. I always get dumped on that one. <laughs> I thank you for your time.